This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with Olympic judo athlete Ben Fletcher. He discusses his time at Rio 2016, along with his experiences of skill development in the judo pathway. This podcast was also recorded over the internet, so it may sound a little different to normal. I hope you enjoy. So uh, Ben, first of all, thanks thanks for coming on. I guess the first question is, how is life in this COVID world that we're living in at the moment? Um, yeah, it's um, definitely strange. Um, so for me, I should have been coming to the end of um, qualification for the Olympic Games and in the space of sort of the last two months, um, something I've been working towards for the last sort of four years is very very much changed um so yeah it's um really quite strange um my day-to-day life has completely changed from sort of tra- training and traveling and competing um and yeah it's very different but it's the same for everybody and it's i think um you know hopefully just going to be for a short period of time and yeah we'll all get through it hopefully and so i guess for people that don't know who you are don't know your background you just want to explain kind of what type of athlete you are and what you do and all that type of stuff. Okay, so I'm a um I'm a judo athlete. Um I I compete for Ireland. I used to compete for Great Britain um and changed over to uh fight for Ireland in twenty seventeen. Um and I fight in the under one hundred kilos category. Okay, so I guess the first question, which is how come you changed, if you don't mind me asking. No, it's absolutely fine. So um it's a little bit of a um backstory so um i moved to bath when i was 18 um i had no sort of like well i, I essentially wanted to move so i could go full time um and give judo a proper go um i never really expected to get anywhere um but uh, i had very supportive parents and uh, they run a garden center and i would work there on the weekend and then i moved to bath for the week um i stayed in like a little box room in my sister's house because she was at uni in Bath and Bath happens to be, or well, at the time it was one of the best places you could possibly train and still is uh, in the UK. Um, and I moved to Bath, uh, had all my success in Bath and about six years into being in Bath, um, British Judo decided to change how they were running things um, and they wanted to create a centralised programme. So instead of having, say, three or four places where the top athletes in the country could, could train, they were going to change and make one one place. Um, and they had tried this before in a place um, in Dartford in Kent. And it essentially didn't go particularly well. Um, and I'd sort of seen that. And then after Dartford, you could sort of train elsewhere. You could train in Bath. You could train in Edinburgh. You could train um, in Camberley. There's a few different places you could train. Um, and then they decided to centralise again. And they decided to centralise in Walsall, just outside of Birmingham. Um, and... I, you know, I, I still am in Bath. I love being in Bath and think that training at the sports training village is fantastic. Um, my coach there, Jürgen Klinger, is, you know, he's up there with some of the best coaches in the world um, and has, has coached Olympic champions. Um, and I didn't feel any reason to move. Um, at the time, I was the top-ranked male in Britain, not just in my weight, but in at all of the weights. Um, and I, you know, it wasn't because I didn't like the people in Warsaw. It was because I felt what I was doing was really, you know, really good. Um, and they they wanted people to move to a program which is untested and, you know, hadn't proven itself yet. I, you know, felt that all of my best results all, um, had, had come from the program in Bath and I'd chosen to move there and loved being there and, you know, wanted to be there and work with my coach and um, had fantastic training partners. Um, so if you didn't move to Warsaw, you would get your funding cut. So obviously that was quite a quandary for me because you know, I felt one in one aspect my uh, best place to perform would be in Bath, but if you didn't move to Warsaw, you wouldn't get any funding. So 
do you know like all sport is very expensive and you're traveling all over the world to you know get ranking points and compete at these the top tournaments so it's very difficult to do that um so the year after the olympic games was the year when they tried to centralize in warsaw um and that year i tried to self-fund because if you um, didn't move your funding cut um and the only other way that you could go to tournaments and stuff is self-funding so i found a few private sponsors um i worked quite a lot i worked with my parents and a few other bits and pieces but after a year of doing that i realized you know it's just not an option um it, it's not a feasible option because you never end up with enough money to do it properly well you're either training enough but not working enough to make the right amount of money or you're working more to earn more but then you can't uh, train enough so the balance is very difficult to get um and after world championships i basically said to Jürgen, my coach i was like look i i need to change this this isn't going to um this isn't sustainable and i need to find a way to make it sustainable um now i have an irish mother um so i've always been half Irish um, and have an Irish passport anyway um, and Megan my sister who also does judo to a high level and one of the other uh, British lads who's got Irish her heritage um, had moved and decided to uh, fight for Ireland so I knew it could be an option but for me I'd been to an Olympic Games for Great Britain so there was a lot of potential difficulty there um, but it got to the point where I felt that if I'm moved to somewhere where I knew wasn't going to be better for me, I was sort of moving for, you know, reasons which weren't going to improve me as a judo player. So I decided that I'd either change and fight for Ireland or I'd quit because for me, admitting to move somewhere where I knew I wasn't going to be a better player is just not for me. Um, so I had a meeting with the performance team and basically asked outright if I could move um, and they were very very nice and they they allowed me to leave um, that's kind of a short version it was went on for, for months and British you know didn't want me to leave and you know I I, I wouldn't say I pushed um, too hard but I just sort of asked very nicely and it was a, it was an amicable dis decision from both sides so um, I was able to leave and fight for Ireland and that's what I've been doing since 2017. So are you the only athlete, apart from the two that you mentioned, that's done that? Or is there other athletes who have been in a similar predicament to you? Um, from British judo or in, yeah. in, in world judo? British judo. No, so there's um, there's a girl I'm friends with, also trends in Bath, um, Prisca Witi Alcaraz. She fights for Mexico. She's got a Mexican mum. So she fights for Mexico now. There's um, Ebony Drysdale Daly. She's got... Um, Jamaican heritage, so she uh, fights in Jamaica now. But there's quite a few people who who have left um, and uh, decided that the centralised program wasn't for them, and um, they were, you know, wanted to try and make it work uh, competing for somebody else. And then for for this centralised program, have they given a time scale for how long they're looking for? till they can see results so are they saying they should see results in tokyo or is it the olympics after that how, how? um so the, i think with the i'm a little bit foggy on the details now because i'm a little bit outside of um the politics within british you know and I'd like to keep myself outside of that but um they they i think need some results to come tokyo um for this program to continue um I think if they were to get a medal, I think it's a medal of two maybe, um, keeps their funding. But if they weren't, then there might be a complete change. I, I, I don't know necessarily what the, you know, what the ramifications would be, that would be of that if they didn't get all the the results they need. Okay. So in terms of for you, where where were you originally based? Where did you start? Or like where where do your parents live? Where are you originally from? So I'm from um, Wokingham in Berkshire. So I grew up in working in Berkshire and um, started judo at the Palma Judo Club, um, which within junior junior judo has always been quite um, quite a, a big judo club um, in the UK. Um, 
my first coach, Don Werner, who unfortunately isn't with us anymore, um, had quite a, um, you know, had for, for what is reasonably, well, quite a reasonably small club, was very successful at junior level and even senior web level with, with women. He had um, a number of world champions and uh, Olympic silver medalist with Nicola Fairbrother. So I was very lucky to have that club 10 minutes from my, my house growing up. Um, and I'm the youngest of five. So everybody else, like, before me all did judo. So my three older half-brothers, um, when they were growing up, my dad was basically like, look, I need to find something to get them to channel their energy in because uh, they're just at home, just, like, attacking each other. And he was like, right, I need to find something to push them into. And, um, yeah, luckily we had a good, you know, a good judo club nearby. And um, then when he had me and my sister, he thought, you know, it's a really good thing to to go into and um judo is a really good um is a really good tool to balance some people out like there's so many people who are really sort of hyperactive it can really quiet you down and like show make you show respect and for me i was quite a shy child and it sort of brought a lot of self-confidence out of me and um but yeah that's all a, a product of i'm a judo club really. why why do you think that is why do you think it brings either the louder side out of some people more confident or quieten some people down i think in its nature i think there's a lot of so judo um has japanese origins so there's a lot of um i don't know if you know a lot about japanese culture but there's a lot of honor based and a lot of things and discipline and um so that's like really deeply set within judo um and that will be the case when you practice you know you bow beforehand you um you always you know you're always very respectful um and also so i think that that would be a reason why it would quieten people down and help people relax and be less hyperactive but also you're literally getting hold of somebody and trying to throw them or hold them or arm lock or strangle somebody so like you know it's quite kind of a baptism of fire for somebody who you know, isn't particularly confident, you know, and I think it, it's also like, you know, everybody loses, everybody, you know, and it's individual as well. So you, it's very difficult to, you know, nobody goes unbeaten. So everybody gets humbled and you have to stay humble because of that, you know, and not that everybody can be everybody, but, you know, there's not many big fish in small ponds within judo, you know, everybody catches somebody and, everybody gets beaten so and there's also nobody else to blame you know if it's an individual sport you can't say oh you weren't in the right position or you should have done this it's you know you know sometimes you can blame the referee but you know a lot of the time it's you could have done something better so i guess part of that as well as you're moving up the age groups you're going to be fighting people that are maybe a little bit younger than you or a little bit older than you and again, that humbling process of getting caught in stuff or not being the strongest or the most powerful kind of navigates itself all the way through the journey. Oh, yeah, 100%. And like there's even now when I'm fighting right at the top top level, um, there's there's always somebody new. Every year there's like a new, fresh, young junior who's absolute dynamite and will come through and you have to put up with them and find new strategies. And the thing that I love with judo is it's like constantly evolving and it's never, not that any sport is stale, but there's like constantly new influences and new fresh things going on with judo. And um, that's what keeps it fresh and keeps everybody humble. And like you say, as, as you grow up and you go through the age groups, you find older people and younger people and, yeah, it's, it's definitely keeps you humble and grounded and you know, for me it definitely has. So obviously you mentioned there that you're one of well, the youngest of, of five. Kind of, mm. Did that play a part in your humbling? Because I imagine if you were doing judo against those guys, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't yeah, have come yeah, out on top so a lot. There was, um, yeah, also, oh, and my, my sister's sort of three years older than me, so like... Okay. She was quite a bit bigger than me for <laughs> a lot of my childhood. So, like, um, my parents used to get us to, like, they thought, like, if we did judo together, it would sort of get our, um, those sort of, like, 
childhood spats out of at judo, and so we wouldn't bring it home. But that's completely opposite. It just ended up just judo at home, like, like <laughs> throwing each other. And um, but yeah, like like you say, it definitely I've been old older siblings and people who are a lot bigger than you growing up. It's you know, it's definitely um, you, you end up being in a hierarchy, <laughs> and like you understand, like you know, not to overstep your mark too much. It's interesting. I know there's research out there that kind of shows the chronological order of kids and what effect it has. And it says like your oldest one, because they used to win and in the household and stuff, they'd struggle maybe a little bit more with failure because of the fact that they're so used to winning where the younger ones who maybe are used to losing in races or not being the quickest or not being the strongest become really yeah. resilient because of the fact that they, um, they're used to getting pinned or, or whatever. But then when, mm-hmm. if they even out size wise, it then ends up with the younger one possibly being in a better position to win because they're, they're, they're not that fussed about if they lose, whereas the older one is like, if they lose, it's the end of the world. Going, how have I lost to my younger yeah. sibling and all that type of stuff? Yeah, I, I imagine they develop a mindset which, you know, it's more growth mindset than, you know, everything is on on, Performance <laughs> on, that, now. on that race or yeah. on that competition or... Yeah. So looking back now in terms of your looking back with hindsight, why do you think your judo club w- was so successful? Obviously you've mentioned there they had world champions come out of a relatively small judo club. C- can you pin down why that is? Well, um Don he was a, a very interesting guy. He, but he was very he was very focused on uh producing performance players and he it was quite um, like if you wanted to join the club, that was great. But he was very like very honest with that. He wanted to get results from the players, um, and he you know would train. We were trained really really hard, like from a young age. Um, and there was sort of you'd only be like sort of two or three sessions a week, but like they were really tough sessions, and like everybody's really well drilled. Everybody was really like sort of bought into a certain style and yeah I think that was that was why especially like with within junior judo it was like really you know really quite successful for a number of years and like got some really really good results um but I think that was also it's probably it's a uh, downfall as well because when you come to senior judo and like the world level it you know there's a lot more you have to be a lot more open and like have a lot more um well i think you just have to be a better judo player than what i was when i when i left there you know i had to do a lot of work after there to to get to the point i am now and obviously i'm still learning and still progressing but um the the style that i learned growing up was very successful to a junior level but uh when it came to seniors and senior men's judo you know I definitely struggled. So what were the differences? What was the transition you had to make or the gaps you had to bridge? Um, so a lot of the, the, the training we do is sort of drill-based. Um, so it would mean you're really, really good if you're in X situation, but then as soon as you're out of that situation, you're, you know, like flying in the wind and not, absolutely no idea what, what you have to do. Um my coach now, Jürgen, um, we do a lot of things in open situations. So you're sort of, you can react well to those. Um, and you sort of, yeah, we don't do it. It's, it's a very different approach. And I think there's a lot of people will have sort of somewhere in between, whereas Don was one way, Jürgen's the other, and both have been very successful. Um, but it's, yeah, it's definitely growing up to, become more senior men judo it's i can't put my finger on exactly why it would be but i think it just makes you too narrow in your focus and too narrow in your ability of what you can do like i had to sort of expand my coordination level and try new throws and i couldn't do that with just on a drill based level like (laughs) judo is is so complex that it's like there's that there's no way that I could continue just doing drills over and over and over of the same stuff. I had to like really expand my horizon and broaden my horizons to to new things and 
Yeah. And so was he very based like on the fundamentals of judo or was it he went into some quite complex stuff as well? Um, my first coach? Yeah. Um, so he, his would probably be, it probably wouldn't be so much on the fundamentals. It would probably be more um, like specialised. That's, that's probably the thing. His his view is quite specialised in a very certain style within judo. So he's um, like really hard in certain aspects of the ground and um, a, a certain few techniques. Can you explain but, those? Can you explain what ones you're talking about? Um, in judo? In, yeah, in ju- yeah, in judo. So we, we do a lot of drop attacks, a lot of like drop Sianagi attacks and those sorts of things, which is, I still use now, but um, I needed to broaden my horizons to like getting in close. So there's, there's so many influences in judo through different wrestling and those um, those areas that I, I needed to explore those as well. And, you know, if you're very, if you're quite narrow and specialised, when you then come up against that, you've got to be so much better at what you do that, like, if you're not used to that um, or have any experience with those styles and you're going to be so, you know, you're going to be come up short, I really think. It's difficult to explain because, like, Jürgen, we, we've got more of a... Um, there's there's a lot more skills outside of the the narrow sort of narrower focus that Don would have. His would be like a lot of repetitions of entry steps in and out, in and out, in and out for a long time. Whereas with with Jurgen, it's a lot more sort of like open and randori focus. And randori in judo is like free practice. So like you, it's literally like open and you just sparring. Is it this this is judo equivalent of sparring? Um, and it's a lot more focused on that and seeing how you react to loads of different situations instead of just drilling entry steps and stuff. So I would end up being quite limited in terms of the initial exchanges. And, um, so like the gripping exchanges and actually getting to the point where I've got my grip to throw. But a lot of it's like getting to that point to to try and throw somebody. Yeah. You know, setting up the movement and everything, that's why you need quite a wide coordination base. And if you're just sort of being quite um, repetitive on the um, the entry steps for the actual throws, you'll get really good at that. But outside of that, actually getting to that point, you know... You, so it's almost you know, like you, you had the, the finishing move but didn't have the building blocks to use that. Exactly that. So when I say, like, specialised, it was like... Um, exactly like you had the end product but you didn't have everything before that like so and the thing is with judo when you if you if you were to teach judo in a club you would teach the throws first it's, it's funny because you it's like I, I don't know with football but it'd be like sc- like you start with scoring the goal or like the, the final like putting it past the keeper yeah. but it's like learning all the things before that yeah. are like the most important bits to get you to that point so, like, for me, it would be like, so, as you know, with judo, you wear suits, it's like getting to the point on the kit where you're in the right position where you influence the person so that they are in the right position so you can attack. And that's like, that's like you'll get that two or three times maximum in a fight. So I've got to put pressure on the person and break them up to the point where they're really compromised and I can attack. And I'm sure that would be the same in it. In any other sport, like you put somebody under pressure, mistake, opportunity. Capitalize, yeah. So, and then, you, like you say, then you capitalize, and you can, you have the weapons to in, in order to to succeed from that. Yeah. So, did you move to Bath when you were eighteen? Did you say? Yes. So you finished. So, I, so what yeah, was your journey through? Brain, sorry, go on. No, so it's, what was your journey? Obviously, you would have been at Pinewood, kind of going through the age groups and stuff. I assume competing kind of yeah. regionally and whatnot. And then, what was the decision to go? Actually, I'm going to give this a go. Why was that your decision in the end? So, I was at Pinewood from when I was five to eighteen, and I still, um, I still, you know, go to the club. I'm still, um, I don't want to say I'm a patron of the club, but I'm still like 
involved and still go to the Christmas party and I still see the the coach now a lot and have a really good relationship with the club. Um, but it was getting to the point when I was around 17, 18 and maybe a little bit before that, I was sort of one of the better juniors in my way, but I didn't have like the people to train with. Um, and we'd been doing basically the, the same stuff then that I've been doing since I was, you know, really early teens. Um, so when we had like the special, I was like, really good with like certain things. And then I had like massive gaps in my knowledge and like what I, and I really need to make, make that up if I was ever going to improve with judo. Um, and for that, like, I needed, I felt I needed to move somewhere else. Um, and, you know, not that I didn't think what we we had done at Pinewood was good, but it was, I needed to find something, something else and somewhere to, to progress. And that's just like the, the situation in the UK a lot. Like you have a good club, but then to, to accent, ascend the ne- to the next level you need to go to like um one of the more performance-based clubs or centers Bath's one of those edinburgh camberley there's there's a lot of those um and that's that's normally what people will do and for me it was just a time where i'm a, like a larger player i'm about under 100 kilos there's not many athletes and there wasn't enough at the club so i, I just felt i needed to move on okay so obviously you, you decided to move down to bath and um, go down that kind of performance route how did you make that transition and what was it like earlier on when you're going into those groups obviously with some I'd imagine some very good athletes slightly different to what you'd experienced back in Pinewood what was that transition like yeah it was um, it's difficult really difficult um, so I used to um, like I said Megan my sister she was at university at Park um like before so I would go down and like do like like half term down there or something like that and it like go down most weeks on a Monday night um for like sparring and randori um so I I had like quite a I'd, I'd go reasonably often anyway but I know I wanted to move full-time eventually um so it was quite good because there was a, a gradual process to me moving but then even when you move full-time it's a real like a real like uh, surprise like I, and the thing was I was even doing like gym programs that the SNC coach in Bath had given me and I was doing them back home but when you move from doing sort of three judo sessions and two gym programs a week to training two times every day with some of the best athletes in the country people who are a lot older than you you know it, it really is difficult <laughs> and uh, yeah it's kind of a little bit sink or swim you know and so you, I guess that's an easier transition because you knew some of the people you're coming in towards and all that type of stuff. How did you take to kind of your sparring partners and whatnot over that period? Um, obviously, you're coming in, you're training full time, essentially competing against one another. How, mm. how, how was that for you? Yeah, I think um, it's, you know, do, do you know, it's funny because like when you're on the mat, it's very much like, it's not that you want to beat somebody up, but you've got to go through them to actually to do what you need to do and to win. Um, so, like, I think it was it's always difficult when you beat new people, and um, you know, especially in judo. But there's always that under level underlying level of respect, and you know, there's never it never continues off the mat really, um, or it very very rarely does. So. It's sort of always sort of mutual respect on the mat, and then and and it off as well. And everybody kind of realizes what you have to do to succeed and try and get better. So it's going to be the case that sometimes you have to be a little bit hard in sparring, but you know it's all it's understood what the person's trying to do, and that person will be trying to do it back to you. And it's all in the grand grander scheme of trying to get better at you know, individually and as a group. And did you feel the benefits of competing against better athletes, maybe more experienced or physically who are able to train and whatnot twice a day? Did you feel those benefits as soon as you went down there? Yeah, hundred percent. I think you, when you start in a new place like that, you will improve quite quickly. Like it's going to be very difficult um, because of the training load and a lot of other factors, but you will definitely improve 
really quickly because like in I know in wrestling they call it the rub. Like when you when you compete against somebody who's that much better than you, you learn off of them, you get tips from them, but also just dealing with that higher level, you know, it, it makes you like I say, it was a little bit single swim, you either find a way to get better or you you don't. And, you know, I was very determined to make sure that I improved. And was there anything you can pinpoint now where you go, actually, I learned that quite early on, this is something I needed to work on, or this was an area of development, or actually, I'm pretty good at this, where I thought it might be something I was average at, but this is something I'm really good at? Um, well, I there was always some really good um, beliefs that I took from Pinewood, and like resilience, and like at Pinewood, we'd always train for like, say, two and a half hours, that's a really long time, so I would be able to train and i had a really good engine and could could go and go and go and for the whole session and sort of be relentless and that's still one of my um my strengths in a, in a competition um and i think that's one of the things that i realized quite early on that i was good at but um on the other side from what i said earlier like when i was quite specialized in certain things and then i went into a, a bear pit of really <laughs> really strong um, formidable lads who were like some of the best in the country. Um, yeah, it, it's sort of, you know, and the thing is, in a fighting sport of judo, you, know, you, you can't hide anywhere. So, you, you know, if you're not, I, I can't think right now exactly what I'd have been lacking, but like, I do know that if you're in that environment and you're in any way lacking, you can't, there's, there's, there's nowhere to hide, you know, and your weaknesses get found out really quickly. And now it's my understanding from talking to Tom and listening to different uh, podcasts and people that one of the, the good things about judo, same with jiu-jitsu and stuff, is there's quite a good uh, relationship between players in terms of learning techniques and whatnot as well. Yeah. How did you find that going into a, a place where you've got more experienced athletes who might be national, international level and you're trying to learn techniques from them? How was that process for you? Yeah, it was great. I like that in Bath. We everybody was like a judo group is is sort of it's very close, like you just said. Like everybody's sort of like a big family. Like not everybody gets on the best all the time, but everybody's out to to help and to like sort of get better as a group. Um, and there's always somebody will be like, "Why don't you try this or this could work?" Or and everybody's bouncing ideas off each other. And especially in technical sessions, um, everybody's trying to help each other. Um, so yeah I, I, that was one of the reasons why I moved there because I knew there was such good judo players such good coaching um, and yeah it's it's just a really it's just a really good place to be it's like a melting pot of ideas of, of, of judo and people who are really good technically and like, like I said I was probably quite specialised so I needed to have my my horizons broadened to new new ideas and how I could do things differently and that's one of the reasons why I moved you know and just to see new things get um get a new perspective from people who want to help you and you can help them and you know you know get better as a as a group and as individ and as individuals and do you take ownership of that now still in that group I assume you're one of the more senior ones do you still look to ensure there's that melting pot oh 100 percent. and like like i i will always try and like i'm i try and think that i'm quite creative with how i um with how i with how i train in that so i think i will always try and like be creative myself but then like try and push ideas onto other people and like see if they'll try it and see if it could work and you know just you know, I think for, for me, I'd like I'd prefer to, to say some say something to somebody and they go, actually, that's not for me, than not say it and you know wish I had. So I think I'm I'm definitely one of the older players now. I think I will always sort of try and um, give people advice if I can, and especially like trying to you know improve or give give words of advice if I can. And I guess that takes quite a lot of self-reflection in terms of knowing what your game is or knowing how that could benefit you or might not benefit you how do you go about that 
as an athlete how do you go about having that self-awareness to understand what things work for you and what things might not um well i think that for, for me it, like i'm quite a reflective person anyway but i think um judo is it's very cutthroat in the respect that you will like you'll have lost fight because of, of, of a reason or you will have been thrown because of a reason or you would have been pinned for a certain reason so it's very it's quite obvious what that is so you learn that from going back over things um and just like you say reflecting and just being like what right why did that happen how can i improve it and that that's for me that's like in, in every aspect it's how do i get better and why did that happen and how do i how to improve that and so if you were getting caught in a on a particular throw or particular grip on a regular occurrence and you were reflecting on this is something actually i really struggle with what process would you put in place to try and improve in that area um, so a lot of the time in judo, proactivity is like one of the best things. So say if there's a certain grip that somebody gets which leads to this throw, it's sometimes just stopping them getting that grip or putting yourself in that exact situation and finding a way that you can stop that. Um, because everybody has holes in their game. Everybody, you know, you know, can can be better as and everybody has weaknesses. Um, so it's just like. Being, I think the biggest thing with that is just being completely honest with what the reason is why, you know, X, Y, or Z has happened. And you go, okay, this is why it's happened. How do I stop it? Um, try and, and then try and put in different measures, you know, like, like I said, try and be proactive to try and like stop the situation even coming to that in the first place. So for me, like stopping somebody getting the grip that they want to do that. And then, okay, what has happened? If they've got into the right position, then what do I do? And then, trying to find a number of different ways to stop that. Do you think that links back to, because I mean, that, that's quite a reflective practice. Obviously it's quite resilient because if you keep getting caught in the same way, it'd be easy to go, oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm done with this type of thing. Do you think that links back to when you're growing up in judo, that process of constantly being humbled and going, you've got to find a way, you've got to find a way, you've got to, got to find it. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's definitely that because, like, it doesn't matter who you are. Everybody loses, in you know. Like, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's some, you know, there's maybe a point, point one percent who, who very, very rarely lose. But everybody loses, and everybody doesn't have a, um, don't have, doesn't have a great day. But then everybody on top of that will always have weaknesses, and those weaknesses will always be exposed. And with you know, you do a lot of randori, a lot of sparring, and, you know, not everybody's going to be their best every day. And especially if you're training with really good, good, really good level athletes, those weaknesses are going to be exploited. So, you know, it's, it's something that you, I think it's just built into judo. You know, like, you stay humble because you're always being tested, or you should always be trying to be tested um, and trying new things to, to better yourself and better yourself as a judo player. And that's just how. I think for the vast majority of people who are trying to get better in judo, that's just how it is. I guess get you to reflect a little bit. When I when I typed your name in after you agreed to come on, one of the things that flashed up was an article by Team Bath that showed a picture of um, everyone in the dojo, uh, um, Team Bath, watching, I assume, a screen of you competing at Rio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's quite a nice picture and there's a lot of people there which I think is obviously a testament to you in terms of your character, the fact that people wanted to come in and watch. When you reflect back on that process now in terms of, you know, getting there in itself and the qualification towards that, to the being in the athlete village and stuff, how did you find that whole Olympics? How how was that for you? Um, it's a strange old thing, Olympic Games, mate. It's um like... Like think, thinking about like the people being in the in the dojo and like that day there were like tested judo sessions and people could come and that was like for me I was like at least there's some like positive to the day because you know I unfortunately went out first round and you know wish wish I could have had more but it's um 
for me, like in 2016, it was a really big deal for me just to qualify um, and to, to the the qualifying um, for Giro is, is rigorous. It's like over two years, and it's it's not like you you get a certain time and you go or you get you have to be. I think at that point it was top 21 in the world, um, and now it's top 18, which is really helpful. Um, <laughs> We, we definitely didn't need it to be, be any harder. But um, anyway, so for me, just to be at that time, just to be at that level was a real big deal because, as you can imagine, like every tournament, the places are changing around and shifting, and it was really touch and go whether or not I was going to be, um, whether I was going to qualify. So just to qualify, it was a really big deal. And it was like I did everything possible to be at my best. Um, but ultimately, it wasn't enough, and it, it was a really good experience to go to a games and you know just be there. Not that I wanted to just be there; I wanted to perform and, and medal. But you know, it, it wasn't to be. Um, but what was it, what was that process like? Obviously, you've 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 qualified. You you've booked your plane ticket, if you like. What are the steps for you to actually arrive there? You know, in terms of like getting kit in terms of actually getting to Brazil, in terms of opening ceremony, in terms of finding out who you're rooming with, what what does that process actually entail? Um so once you once you've qualified it'll be um I think that was sort of the end of May and then the games are end of July and August. So from there like I had like a little holiday just because I was completely destroyed from the, the qualification period. So from there, it was sort of step back a little bit, have a little holiday. Um, and then I went three weeks to Japan to basically, you know, rebuild what I could again. Um, then came back. Then it's, um, it was straight into a camp um, to prepare then. Um, and at that point, I was uh, still with Great Britain. So it was a camp in Walsall in the Midlands. And from there, we went to the NIA to get the um, to get all your kit and, it's outrageous what you what you can get like in kits like it's like it's like it's it's too much it's it's silly like um you get like four large holders full of kit you get like a suit you get everything like everything you can think of you 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 get um and then from there like, there's like the process is like it all happens really really quickly um so from there it was like a few days at home and then um, flew out to Belo Horizonte in Brazil, which is where the holding camp was. We were there for about a week. And then from there, it was a week in the village and then, then competed. And so for you, being in that athlete village and stuff, I must imagine that's quite surreal from someone you was touch and go whether you're going to even be going on the plane and stuff to then walk around and obviously being there with all the other GB athletes and, and yeah. whatnot. Did you feel like you were part of the team? Did you feel like you ch- um, ch- it, it's, it's it's a strange thing because it's really really surreal, um, and yeah, it, it, I don't know how to. Like, I I did feel part of the team and that sort of thing. It was um, made to feel very welcome, um, but it is such a strange thing, and it's like. There's a lot of different personalities and that there, and like obviously you get on with some people and not others, but it's it's just a, a strange environment where you're walking around and there's celebrities that you only see on TV like in the lift with you, and you're just like that's Mo Farah, and then you're like okay, and then the, I think it was either the first or second night we were there, like un, underneath the um, the accommodation block we were in, there's a, a ping pong table, me and uh, two of the GB lads, and I think a couple of girls were there just playing ping pong. Andy Murray walks over with the Davis Cup team and says, oh, can we join in? And we're playing around the world to where you run around hitting it like with Andy Murray and the Davis Cup team and you're just like, what is happening? Like, this is just like, <laughs> uh, and it's just, yeah. And there's, there's, there's a lot of real positives to that, to that trip and a lot of um, really good memories from like before and after. But also, it's you know, it's very difficult as well. Like your your whole life is built up to that moment as well, and then if it doesn't go how you want it to, it's sort of it's a really really strange 
know, so if we, 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 <laughs> yeah, we can, we can talk about the, the other side in a bit, but I guess you're leaning towards the, more the performance side. So when you look back now, is there anything you look at and you go, I would have done this differently, apart from obviously win? Mm. Is there anything you look back and go, actually, my preparation, I would have done this differently or... Uh, I I doesn't I don't think that was the right move. Yeah, well, um, well, the, the big the biggest thing that would have helped is if I'd qualified earlier. Um, but like that was just you know because the earlier you qualify, the better results. The more you can sort of step back earlier and then give yourself more time to prepare. But that wasn't really an option for me, so I had to go to the, right to the last day and qualify. Um, but what that meant was I was then absolutely destroyed by the end of qualification and then you've sort of got you know sounds silly you've then got to get yourself back up again to to go again and it's getting yourself back up to the end of games is difficult but physically you're mashed you know you're just completely like not not in the right right place um so um preparation wise then like i wouldn't do anything differently i i I prepared really well um one thing I, i if i had my time again, I wouldn't have been in the, the village as long. Uh, so I was in the village for about a week before I competed. Um, and we, like me, I think, basically I think the whole team by the, the lightweight, Ashley McKenzie, he went in on the a day earlier than us. So the the village itself is like, it's amazing, but it's got this, it's so energetic and so bells and whistles and everything happening that it's very distracting. And I try to stay away from that as much as possible, but I don't necessarily think it's the the right environment to be in for an extended period before you compete. Like, if not that I'm blaming anybody for that, but if I, you know, it was my first Olympic game, so I wouldn't have known that. But if I, um, if I qualify and everything this time, then I will want to not be in the Olympic Village more than two or three days beforehand. I think a week is just a long time to be there and it's it's quite draining to be there. Um, for me, I, I'd always prefer to be like sort of a bit more outside, a bit more relaxed atmosphere. And um, So yeah, that's that's probably the main thing that I would change. But um, and then in terms that of... that would have made a big difference or not, I, no, I don't know. And then in terms of um, kind of the com- competition side itself, obviously... You, you know where the venue is, all, all that type of stuff. You're going there with, with coaches. I assume it's not the coaches that obviously you normally work with in Bath, but they're the people you would have worked with in Warsaw and stuff. What's the process yeah. for you going to the arena in the day and kind of how many... Is it similar to normal competitions where you might have a multiple fights in a day if you get past the first round? And um, What does that yeah, like I competition mean, day look I mean, like? like uh, that would be one thing that I would have changed. Like, I would have had my own personal coach there, but like that's neither here nor there as well. That's that wasn't an option at the time. Um, but yeah, it's the Olympics are the, in in the judo is exactly the same as any other event. So it's just one day you'll probably have five six fights if you get to a medal fight, and then um, from there, you know, yeah, sorry, you'll have uh, five or six fights within the day, um, and you know if you lose first fight, you're out. Um, if you don't get to the quarterfinals, you're you're out. Um, and yeah, it's can be amazing, can be devastating. You know, it's um, and everything in between. And did it feel different when when you're putting on your your gi with Great Britain badge or writing on the back and stuff? Does it feel different to a normal competition? Did did the build up to it feel different? Yeah, the build up was different. It's 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 strange in a way. Um, you, you, I, I find with, with any competition, you try and normalise things as, as much as you can. And I have to say, like, the the first day I walked into the competition hall, like, because there's so much hype beforehand, you get in, get interviewed before competitions, and that, that never happens for judo athletes. And, you know, you're around loads of other people that you wouldn't normally be around. And then it was a real sigh of relief for me when I walked into the competition on the first day. I think it was one of the lightweights. And you're just like, oh, it's just a judo competition. It's, you know, two athletes, two coaches, and a referee. And everything else is, you know, kind of irrelevant. You know, it's that's what it is. Um, 
and I remember feeling like a real sigh of release after after that. And it was so funny because like you're just like, of course that's what it is, but like it's 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 so easy to get wrapped up in everything the Olympic Games are when really it's as hard or or it's just as hard as any other tournament that I would have been in. You know, I would have been to a World Championships, so I would have been to, you know, Grand Slams at that point and I'd be fighting the same people, but it's just a different different name at the top. Yeah, and then I guess how how long before did you know who your opponent was and uh, had you faced him before? Um, no, so because I was day six, so it's one weight for men and one weight for women um, over a seven day period. So I was day six, so I knew basically a week beforehand, which is helpful, but it's also like quite nerve wracking as well. Yeah. Um, I had fought him before and it hadn't gone well, <laughs> so that was obviously quite difficult. Um, and then yeah, there's people like talking on social media and that sort of thing. He's just trying to stay stay away from that as well. It's um yeah. It's um it's difficult, but that's also like part of the challenge of like of adapting to that situation and not allowing it to be too stressful and too too zapping of energy. And have you have you faced him since? No, so it was it was quite a strange situation. Um, I've I've trained with him like in on like a, um, a sparring camp, but I've never actually um like uh like in a competition for him. Um. It's quite strange because he was there's two really really good athletes in the weight below, um in ninety kilos, uh for Georgia, um and the uh the guy that I fought actually moved up a year before the games, um and nobody actually thought he had actually qualified, and he ended up having like an absolutely blinding run and like won some of the, the hardest tournaments just before the end of qualification and sort of came into the games in really good form, um. I only ended up getting seventh, but I think, like, I, I I think I even said before the draw came out, like he's the person that nobody wants, and then I ended up getting it. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it's not ideal, but you know it's what, what it was. So. And so then, obviously, you've you've lost the fight, and you know, kind of that's you done for the for the day and for the the Olympics and stuff. How was that feeling for you? What what was it like after that? Um, I, yeah, like pretty depressing, really. Um, yeah, like it, it's one of those. I had um, a couple of mates out there, and I had like my family out there as well. And it was really nice to see them as well, and just like it was nice that they'd come all that way. But it's also like you just feel like you let people down and wish you could have given more and just wish it had gone differently. Um, but that's also sport and that's also what I do. And that's always something that could happen. It's always something that could be, is in the back of your mind that that might be what happens. So, you know. and What did you do after? Did you stay around and watch? Did you go back to the village? Did you go out with family? What, what did that look like? Um, yeah, so I, I say, um, I remember... I did watch uh, a little bit more because it's like it's one thing. There's always a feeling because there's so much hype and everything. You you always get a feeling of relief a little bit, like because it's so much build up and then it's like like even if you've lost, like and then it was just like oh like you know it was really disappointing. Um, but then um, went for a bit of lunch, spent a bit of time with my family best I could, and then um. um went out afterwards I think <laughs> went out and just um, yeah went out and enjoyed myself for the next couple of weeks really um, stayed in the Olympic Village um, until the closing ceremony which is which is obviously really nice um, some people get flown straight home so it is really nice to stay and experience a bit, a bit more of Rio so um, and how did you uh, find that as a country sort of... sorry Brazil itself and Rio as a city how did you find it yeah, um, amazing. Um, like Rio, um, as a place is is really, really pretty. Um, and I managed to like I headed out and um did some sightseeing, um, myself, which is probably advice because <laughs> Rio's got quite a formidable 
reputation. But um, yeah, um, there's a place called uh, Pedro de uh, Telefono, which is where um, it looks like you're hanging off of a rock. There's um, like a really nice view in the background, and it looks like you're ha- sort of hanging off a rock off to a, a cliff. Um, and like all, all of that area, just sort of, I think, south of Rio is really, really beautiful. Um, and yeah, Brazil uh, people were, were all really, really friendly. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting and uh, yeah, great cult- culture. And I'm, you know, look forward to going back at some point. So then I guess, obviously, you've enjoyed yourself in the Athletes Village and going out and experiencing Rio and whatnot itself. When you then flown back, kind of after the closing ceremony and stuff, what was the process to getting back into back into training? Obviously, I know you'd mentioned earlier that you then kind of difficulties with the wall wall camp and stuff, and what that looked like for you. But what when did you go back into training? What did that look like? What was your mind mind like and all that type of situation? Um. Yeah. So. Um... It was it was one of those things where I had another month of, a month's holiday and um, I needed that just to sort of like you know detach a little bit and just sort of see where I was and just see. Um, like I was twenty four, but I was also a bit like, do I want to continue doing this as well? And like, am, am I going to get better? And for me, it's always been about like whether I am going to get better. Um, and you know, do I do I think I can actually make the next level because. I'd feel like I'd be wasting my time and other people's time if I was not doing it for sort of pure reasons, you know. And with judo, I think that's the only way you can do it because there's no money in it. There's no so you kind of gotta be. Or my my intentions have always been to be doing it strictly to be the best I can be and to challenge myself. Um, and that period was sort of just reaffirming for myself that I'd been doing it for the right reasons and just sort of digesting everything that had happened. Um, and mentally, it was it was really difficult because you know you built up to something, and although it was a big achievement to get there for me, it you know it hadn't gone how you want it to go, and um, yeah, and there was also lingering in the background what was going to happen with Warsaw and all of those things, and I was you know it's it was difficult. There's a lot, a lot of things to consider and. Uh, yeah, it was it was a difficult time, but you know I, you know, came home and spent a bit of time with my family, my friends, and stuff, and that that always helps. So then, if we I guess fast forward a little bit through all the the Warsaw and the, the island stuff, and look back, probably I guess around two thousand and eighteen ish, maybe mm-hmm. two thousand and seventeen, when you're looking at going, actually, I'm going to try and make a run for Tokyo. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go towards that because I feel like I can improve between now and then what would your qualification look like what type of tournaments were you going to or have you gone to and what were those results and then I guess off the back of that if you just want to explain kind of what your training seasons look like and what that might look like from competition to competition month to month week to week day to day I appreciate that's quite a detailed question, but if you just want to go through kind of what your your life as an athlete looks like and, you know, what's on the specific side, if you like. Yeah, yeah. So in judo, um, you'll normally have two majors every year. Um, so there'll be either a European Championships and a World Championships or the Continental Championships and a World Championships or a Continentals and a Olympic Games. Um, and they are the sort of what you peak for within the year. So the Continental is always, always in April, and the um, the World Championships are normally um, end of August, September, or the Olympic Games would be um, July, August sort of time. So they're sort of your markers in the year, what you want to try and peak for. Um, outside of that, so um, what you know, if, if you're uh, looking to try and get to the Olympic Games. You'll be doing a lot of qualification tournaments, and throughout the year, there's a number of um, point scoring events, which are Grand Prix, Grand Slams, and that's where sort of like the real best athletes will be at trying to sort of get points um, to qualify for the Olympics, but also like come into form and raise your world ranking to be in the best position come the the major events like Continentals or the, or the World Championships. So your training will be based around that. Um, so. Yeah, so my year will always start um, 
with a training camp in Austria. There's um in judo we have a lot of like sparring camps where people from all over the world will go and basically spar together. Um, which is probably quite a strange concept, but everybody's sort of like training with. It's very similar to when I moved to Bath, like the same sort of idea that you're going and sort of training with the best people, um, so you're going to get the best reward back, um, or sorry, the best results back. And um, my year will be full of those camps. So they'll, uh, the year will start in Mitsu in Austria, a camp there, um, and then I'll sort of normally compete towards the end of January, start of February, um, probably a couple of times in March, and then main competition will be in the Continentals in, in April. Then probably step back a little bit for a couple of weeks, then rebuild um, more of a generic phase, sort of get um, fitter and stronger, sort of a lot more longer distance running, um, muscle build sort of programs, and then sort of then build towards the World Championships or the Olympic Games again and sort of um, make like little incremental steps along the way. So if it's over a three or four month period, we'll start off um, – everything on more of a generic base with judo i'll be trying new techniques um like i say a lot more longer distance um uh, running side of things and and the the gym work will mirror that um and then everything as you get closer and closer to a major event will be more dynamic more uh, will be shorter will be more sharp will be basically so you're hitting your best stride come the come the major event um and the tournaments in between, you will be in good form, but you won't be quite as good in quite um, of good a form as you would be, you know, hopefully, at the major event. Okay, so if you were looking at a period where maybe you've, you've just competed, you've just been in a tournament, and then you're looking to obviously increase your cardio, maybe put on a little bit of weight, all that type of stuff, what would your training during a week of that look like? Um, if you want to go to specifics in terms of distances you're running, longevity of sessions, gym sessions, what type of weights you're lifting, all that type of stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, w- with most things, it'll all be dependent on the goal. So if I um, need to improve my my VO2 max or my cardio endurance, um, we would normally start with sort of the more longer endurance. I'll be running sort of like a low pace between 45 and 60 minutes. Um, and then sort of longer distance endurance uh, um, endurance intervals, so sort of five times a thousand meters at certain heart rates. Um, so we'll we'll usually test um, a VO2 max. We'll test a step test to give us like a base heart rates to work at, and then we'll sort of take the test again a couple of months later and just make sure, maintain that we're improving all the time or at least maintaining. Um, and then in the gym, it'll be a lot of you know it depends on the goal everything is trying to encourage progression in some way or working on weaknesses or my, my, my SNC coach will, will test certain, um, certain areas and have the data from um, years before and see where we're at in, like with that. And just, you know, basically just trying to find ways to improve across the board constantly. Um, and that's kind of how I, how we look at it and just trying to find weaknesses or trying to you know, plug holes and make a better picture of a judo athlete. And um, yeah, so there'll be a lot of compound lifts in the gym, a lot of um, you know, your typical bench squat deadlift <laughs> um, and just generally trying to work on weaknesses. And that will be the same on the judo mat. That'll be same in the gym and um, running and uh, cardiovascular fitness as well. And so I assume the reps and stuff and weights and stuff you're doing alternates in order to reflect that. Yeah, hundred percent. So it'll be a lot more reps um, towards the start of the block, and then before um, right before a competition, it'll be very like sort of maximum strength, um, and then dynamic movements as well. A lot of jumps, a lot of um, real explosive, like sharp dynamic movements um, right before competition. So I'm really sort of at my most dynamic and at my my best physically before a competition. And in terms of like jump, jumps and box jumps and stuff, what would that look like if you're if you're doing a gym session, maybe a week out to a competition, you're doing box jumps. How many are you doing? Yeah, how many are you doing? What does that look like? How many sets and reps and whatnot? 
Um, probably like four sets of five, like sometimes over hurdles or like um, off of one box onto a, a bigger box. So there's sort of the, the reactive element. Um, but it, it, it all depends on, um, you know, we also do a lot of single leg stuff, like, like um, single leg hops and stops and those sorts of things. The sort of reps and sets sort of escape me at the moment, but it's normally sort of like five each leg um, or five jumps in total. For a number of sets and can you i'm assuming you're trying to minimize the disparity between maybe your right hand side which you're good at throwing off compared to your left hand side is that something you're actively always trying to work on yeah so and that's what one thing in judo so um usually somebody will have a certain way that they grip so for me it's like i'll grip my right hand on top of somebody's shoulder or like sort of on the top of their back and then my left hand will be on their sleeve so I'm a little bit like I'm sort of driving a, a bus almost, like, <laughs> you know, with one, one hand up. And so that will, that will you know, maybe cause imbalances in my my my, uh, my body and how I'll stand. So it's like also in, in the gym, I'm just basically trying to make sure that we, we keep those imbalances as small as possible um, and making sure that I'm in the best physical shape like when I say weaknesses, it's also it's not just so I'm strong through that area, but it's also so I'm stable and I'm less likely to get injured because with judo it's a contact sport. If you're you know you have a weakness somewhere, so if I have a really strong upper body and like no legs, um, that's all well and good until you know somebody tries to attack me and you know my ankles aren't <laughs> aren't fit for purpose, you know, and you can very easily get injured. And then for you, um, on a diet wise, is there a strict diet that you have to be on? I mean, do you? I know competition times. Some people do have to cut weight. Do you have to cut weight for yours, or are you okay? Or how does that look for you? Yeah. So for, for me, it's it's quite it's quite strange because I'm a little bit larger. My my nutritionist basically given me free reign to um, that I have to like, eat a lot of. I have to eat a lot, especially like with two or three sessions every day. So. If you're larger, you're going to be using a lot more calories anyway. And then if you're doing two or three sessions, you're going to be burning calories like you're going out of fashion. Like, there's always people think like the rowers, they burn loads and loads of calories. And that's the same for me. Um, so I I get free range to, you know, just pack in the calories, sort of five, six meals a day with everything, you know. And like, I'm obviously not junk food. I'm, I have to get certain levels of protein in. Um, a lot of carbohydrates, good fats, lots of fruits and vegetables as well. Um, but then, yeah, when it comes around to competition time, I have to be under 100 kilos. So for me, it's a good thing to be 105, 104, 105 beforehand um, and not necessarily to be really lean all the time because if I've got a little bit a little bit more body fat on that sort of facilitates my body to be a little bit better with immunity and also like gives a good environment to um, to grow and repair. But then when it comes down to a competition, I need to gradually bring my weight down so I'm lean and, you know, ready to ready to fight and be able to make weight and make weight in a good way so that I'm not in any way compromised. So what, this is a hard question, but on an average day, average meals, so you mentioned you do five meals a day, what might you eat throughout the day? So breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner. Um, so it's so my breakfast would normally be something along the lines of it, it depends on the day and how much time I have but I'll tr- tr- uh, normally try three or four eggs bacon um, some good sourdough sort of brown toast um, butter coffee juice um, then I'll eat again so that would probably be eight eight thirty in the morning then next meal um it's normally sort of every three, three and a half hours I'll eat. So then again, probably about 12. And then you're looking at sort of like spag bowl, um, pasta, you know, hopefully some, some veg on the side as well. But, you know, hitting all the markers like good protein, um, you know, a good whack of carbs and fat as well. Um, and then also veg as well, three o'clock, three, four o'clock. I normally have, um, if I can get a meal in, I will. If not, I'll have a shake, which is, Normally, um, you know, again, like high calories, you know, going through the day, I normally have creatine as well at that sort of, at that sort of point. 
six o'clock will be like a, my biggest meal of the day. Um, you know, um, anything like a curry, a Thai green curry, fajitas. Um, you know, I like to cook quite a lot, but it's, it's, it's basically around the same sort of recipe of like protein, a lot of carbs, a lot of fat. Um, and so that'll be my biggest meal. And then normally sort of like nine o'clock, I'll have something else, but I'll, then I'll normally have sort of, I normally would have like, um, like kefir or like, um, a live yogurt, um, with porridge oats, protein powder, and then that sort of sustains me like through the the period when I'm going to be asleep, um, and make sure I'm not hungry, but also means that I've got fuel for the for the whole whole night. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave your food there. I don't. <laughs> that's good. Good detail. A lot healthier than a lot of people's diets as well. But um, it, moving forward now, obviously it was it was due to be kind of Tokyo this year, which I imagine you you we're working towards um in terms of your qualification process where were you at with that where where are you now with it what is it going to look like moving forward for you guys kind of what was the current situation with it so there were um there were five tournaments left um i was when i found the, um when it all started to become a little bit more real i don't know for everybody else, but for me, it was sort of like something in the background I was very, very concentrated on qualification. Um, and I was, it was, I think, Wednesday before a tournament when I was going to Morocco. Um, they first cancelled Morocco, and then the next weekend there was a tournament in Russia. That got cancelled, and then basically they just pushed all the tournaments until the end of April, I think it was that, at that point. They basically said, like, we've got to cancel everything until then, until we know more. Um, so obviously that was like, you know, things started to become a lot more real then. And then, you know, before we know it, the Olympics is being postponed until next year. And, um, at the moment we don't really necessarily know what's going to be, how many tournaments there's going to be left, um, in qualification. Um, and it's all still quite up in the air to when we'll be able to fly and travel and, and everything. So we, we, I'm just a little bit left in the lurch at the moment. Um, but whenever it happens, and you know, I'll be ready and raring to to go in. And it's, points um, points wise, at the moment, would would you be close to that qualification standard? Yeah. So, for example, if the um if the qualification finished tomorrow, I'd be I'd be in. You know, so I'm I'm in qualification now. So it's a very different picture this time to um four years ago when I ex- how I explained it. it was a uh, very touch and go. This time it's a it's a li- been a little bit more um, consistent the whole way through. I've been um, sort of getting some of the best results and um, have been up to like seventh in the world ranking um, this time instead of twenty first or whatever. So you know I've been a lot um, a lot closer to the, right at the top and uh, all in all it's been a lot more positive recently. And I guess linking this back to what you said earlier by being higher up in those ra- rankings and whatnot and having more points it means you can pick and choose your tournaments better and hopefully have a period where you'll have a break from your last competition and then be able to train or whatnot ready for the olympics whereas on the last rap time round you have to compete right the way up to olympics and then did, had a short period in which you were able to prepare for it yeah 100 percent. and in theory that's what we would like to do um whether or not that happens, I, you know, I don't know. Like I say, it, it depends on how many tournaments the International Judo Federation put on. Um, so that's the problem we face because if they put in like another 10, 15 tournaments, the points I already have, although they're good, they could be, you know, a little bit irrelevant. So like, <laughs> although there's a certain amount of points in the bag, essentially with judo, you, you qualify over two years and, as you get your first five results from the first year and they're sort of banked already. I've got five good results for, for this year. But, you know, if they put 10 more tournaments on and people behind me start doing really well and they overtake me, you know, I, I then have to then do more to secure my place a bit more. So it's, you know, it's a little bit up in the air and it's, it's how it is. Um, but, yeah, hopefully for me... Um, it would make sense if they just put in five more tournaments like there was going to be. Um, and then I, I think that's fair for, for everybody. And hopefully, 
for the athletes, you can step back a little bit earlier and relax and recover and get the best uh, training in before the games. Okay, so I'm going to ask two more questions to try and finish on a more positive note rather than COVID because I'm sure everyone's sick of it. But um, so the first one for me, what's obviously you looking looking online, you, you you've done really well in a lot of tournaments and, and won medals and whatnot. What's that feeling like when you're able to step up onto a podium with a, a bronze or silver or gold, and you hear the national anthem going or anything like that? How the, how did that make you feel as an athlete? It's it's amazing. It's it's you know it's one of those things where I know it's gonna sound a cliche, but it you know for all the times where it's really difficult and all the hard yards that you make every day and the like sacrifices and you know hard choices that you make, um, it makes it worth it. You know, like for you know for a short while you're just like you know this was completely worth it, and then it's back to the grind. <laughs> but you know, like. And I don't want that to sound like I don't enjoy my day today. I really do, but um, it is, yeah, it's one of those those moments where you just you know can really digest and really realise what you're doing is a really good thing to be doing, and it's really exciting and adrenaline filled and um, and fun, you know, and, and, and it's. Um, it's in those moments that you sort of really get that real strong feeling of emotions that, you know, I don't know that I'd get if I didn't, if I didn't do judo, you know, like you might not get such like low emotions sometimes, but you know, you definitely don't get the highs, you know, if I, if I just worked, you know, well, if I did whatever, you know, I, I wouldn't get the same emotions as I get in judo, you know, and on those moments, it's really sort of, you know, shoved home and you feel really proud and um and emotional, you know, and Is there you know, one that stands out to you? Is there one that you top of your list where you go, actually that's one that I'm really, really proud of or There's been a couple recently, but one last year, um I won the Grand Prix in Marrakesh. Um and like the Irish national anthem was on and it was just like I beat somebody who'd beaten me loads of times before, and I was just really emotional. I, it just felt like so nice to, you know, and before that I hadn't had so many good results, and I'd had like, so this was, I think, March last year, and towards the end of 2018, I'd had like a real tough time. I'd been injured, um, and then I had a good result at the start of the year, but then I had two not so great results, and I sort of thought, like, oh, I'm going to have a slip, my form slipped again. Um, and then to have, you know, to be like on top of the podium um, and the results were coming, it was coming towards the end of the first year of qualification. I didn't have any results really. And to, to get a really, really strong result, to beat somebody I'd never beaten before, it's only the second time I'd ever won a Grand Prix. Um, and yeah, I was, it was just one of those moments where you just completely made up, you know, and yeah, just... Set you on a good path in terms of your mindset moving forward and results moving forward, I guess. Sorry, can you say that again? Set you on a good path in terms of your mindset moving forward and then your results moving forward from that point as well, I guess. Yeah, 100%. And, like, for me, I, I, I don't know if it's the same for everybody else, but, like, I'm sort of 28 now and you never know when enough's going to be enough for you, but then also when you've reached your ceiling. Um, and it's just one of those things where it's just like, no, no, you are good enough to be at this level. You are, you know, you are doing the right thing with your life because it does feel sometimes, especially with judo, like there's no money in it and you're sort of scratching around just to keep things going sometimes. Like it is a positive thing to be doing with your life and you are doing it for good reasons and it's worth doing. Um, and yeah, from there, I then had a really, I, I actually like had a week off and then started training again, went to Japan, had a really good time in Japan, and then got two more really, really good results. Um, one where I got bronze in Baku, which is, you know, I beat um, somebody in the bronze medal fight I hadn't beaten for a long time, who then went on to win the World Championships like, uh, last year. Um, and then uh, equally, probably similar to Marrakesh, um, I got silver in the Ho Hawk Grand Prix in uh, China. Um, and it was one of those days where 
I woke up in the morning, I just didn't feel right. And I felt a bit ill. I just didn't feel, you know, good in myself at all. Um, and, you know, I, I was just sort of like, you know, I have to like get myself up and got to, you know, um, I've got to find some way to win, you know, today. Um, my warm up like couldn't have been worse. I just felt like a rag doll being thrown around and like just just like, oh, like why now? Like, I'm in China, like flying all the way here. Um, and I had a tough fight. I had a Russian guy first fight and like somehow managed to throw him twice really quickly. And I was like, all right, okay, like come on. And I had um, a German guy next round that like I. I don't really like it at all. <laughs> like, there's not many people with judo that I don't like and don't get on with, but this guy, like, if you know him, you might feel the same. <laughs> um, and he, he's just like, he's always been a bit of a bully and just like, you know. Um, but I had him and I'd never beat him before and I beat him really convincingly. And then the next round beat somebody, um, a Mongolian who I'd lost to in back of the tournament before. And just had like a really, really good day. Um, and then I unfortunately lost the world champion um, in the final. And by the end of the day, my knee had swollen up really, like really big and was like really red and um, really uncomfortable. And it wasn't until I got home that I found out I had a cellulitis infection on my knee, which um, is really quite serious. And, you know, you, you can be hospitalized from it and it can turn into sepsis. So I was just like, really proud of myself to like get through a really tough day with you know you know i shouldn't have been able significant to significant injury you know, at that level you know and it was um after that yeah you know, unfortunately because of that i then can fight the european championships but it was like a real big deal for me just to like be able to get through the day um be some of the top players in the world when i really shouldn't have been able to um and i think that will always stick with me is just you know i, I literally remember saying to the irish coach um, Kieran Ward and my sister. I was like, I don't know how I managed to get to the final. I just don't know. Like, like, and Kieran, who is the the Irish coach, basically said to me, he was like, the way you looked in the warm, you just thought, like you're going out first round, like definitely, like, and that's how, exactly how I felt as well. Like nobody said it, but it was like, you know, we both knew. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was just really, really proud to have got through that day, and you know, because uh, you know a great result and a great day that will be lasting in the memory. And then, sorry, I forgot this question I wanted to ask you, so I'm going to put this in as well. <laughs> what would it What would it mean for you if you were able to qualify for Tokyo in terms of being able to compete in judo, almost a spiritual home of the sport and where it's founded, all that type of stuff? It's like a once-in-a-lifetime achievement, mate. It's, it's like it's such a big deal to be able to do it in um, in Japan. Um, we were quite lucky. The World Championships last year were in the same venue as they're going to be for the Games this year. So you sort of got like a, a feeling of how it's going to be. Um, and like you say, judo is like the spiritual home of judo. It's where it's from. And, you know, it would just be amazing to be able to to go there and, you know, and I, I don't want to sound like um, defeatist. It would just be good to take part in it. You know, I want to win it. I want a medal. But it'd also be just an amazing thing to be a part of. And, and also, especially to be there for Ireland as well. And you know, I'd be immensely proud to be there for Ireland. And I'm sure my mum and all my Irish family would be very proud of hopefully me and my sister and uh, Nathan Burns to get there. Um, and, you know, I hope that's the case. And we come back with three medals. Fingers crossed. And then last question, this is actually the last question, and it's one I asked everyone, except for Tom, I forgot to ask him, so I need to get back to in touch with him about that, but um, can you name me the, the best player you've played against or sparred against or coach you've worked with or against and why? Um, okay, so it's, it's, um, I don't know if you'd know, but there's a I don't know if you'd know him, but there's um, a really famous judo guy called uh, Liptiliani, and he's um, I fought him a few times. I've never beaten him, but um, in the first ever time I was in a Grand Slam final, it was like the first time I've been a like around the medals in a in a Grand Slam, and he's world medalist, Olympic medalist, European champion. Like he's he's basically won it all, um, 
And I remember being in the final and like we were up due to be on in about like 10, 15 minutes and I was warming up. He was asleep in the corner. <laughs> and I was literally like, what is he doing? Like, I was like, is he like, is he not taking me seriously or something? Like, and I was just a bit like, what's going on? Like, and literally like dwelled on the fact that he like, why is he asleep? And then he literally got up, like did a, a little bit and then um, like was ready and came through and he ended up beating me. But it like, reminded me of a story of um, like um, Roger Federer. Apparently, did the same sort of thing to Novak Djokovic when Djokovic was really young, and he just sort of like I think it was is one of the tennis tournaments, and they had to stop the final because there was a rain break, and uh, they said to him like, "How long do you want us to call you beforehand?" And he was like, "Oh, just five minutes. I'm gonna go to sleep." Apparently, like Djokovic said afterwards, it completely blew his mind that he could be so confident he was gonna beat Djokovic so easily um, and that was just one really humbling lesson for me like where I was just like he had his game plan down to a T he knew exactly what he had to do to be able to be in the right he'd been in that situation so many times um, and it was just like humbling for me and just like you know when I was talking about you get the rub off somebody you just like it was just like yeah, it was just a, like a very profound moment for me where I was just like, wow, okay, like that's why he's so good. And so um, I've actually forgotten what your question was. <laughs> no, the, the, see, um, what, who's the best person you competed with or against or coach you worked with or against and why, which I think is a good yeah, one. That, 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 was, that was probably like quite something that sticks in the memory again, which I was just like, um, and like I say, he's like a world Olympic and European medalist. He's like one at all. But, um, yeah, it, it was like I almost sort of like so I, I, I still went out and like competed well like for the first couple of minutes before I lost. But it was um, it was just one of those where you just go, this person is like, I don't want to say different level to me, but he was just like. The aura very, of it. And you just go, okay, like that's what I've got to aim for. That's what I've got. And this is a couple of years ago. Um, and I think I'm a lot closer than to him now than I was then but it was just one of those where you think you've done really well to get into a Grand Slam final and then you're like oh yeah there's levels to this I'm yeah. not there yet <laughs> yeah you know? I, I, I've been watching the uh, Michael Jordan Last Dance documentary on Netflix oh, same. It's great, isn't it? unbelievable and I think what you're talking about there the aura of the person and how that affects the people he's competing against and um, I think that was, that's for me one of the takeaways I take from that documentary when you've got people you know that are asking for his jersey or asking for his shoes and stuff whilst they're meant to be playing games and it's because the way that he acts exudes that confidence and you know the almost air of invincibility and it then aff affects the people around, you, around him or playing against him yeah no exactly and there's, there's going to be people like that in all sports and it's, um, like I say, it's humbling to come up against it, but it's definitely one of those things that once you've gone through it, you, well, you should learn from it. I definitely have like how, you know, how spot on some people have it and like how professional and how, how good people are at their sport. Cool. Well, listen, Ben, I appreciate your time and, um, We'll hopefully be keeping tracks for you over the coming periods where hopefully everyone gets back to normal. But it's been really good and interesting to hear your story. And if you're up for it, I'd love to do it again um, further yeah, down the road. To, like, thank you very much for having me on. It, it was my pleasure. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.